All right, sounds like we're live. Um, welcome, everybody, uh, back from lunch. Uh, this panel is on 5G, a glimpse into a massively connected world. Uh, I've got three very distinguished panelists with us today, uh, and I will let them introduce themselves, starting on my left with Heather. Hi, I'm Heather Kirksey. I'm the VP of NFV for the Linux Foundation, and I head up the OPNFV project, uh, which, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, is an open source project focused on um, integrating, deploying, testing um, the next gen uh, software based networking stacks. Hi, this is uh, Balaji Etirajilu. I work in Ericsson as a director of product marketing. Uh, this is my favorite subject 5G. Network slicing, management, and orchestration. We'll enjoy the show. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ling Li. I'm from China Mobile. I uh, previously worked on for the Open O project, and now on the TSC of ONAP. And actually, internally, I'm part of the uh, Nova Net project inside China Mobile, which drives the strategy and also the vision of the next generation network for the company. And we are actually doing um, both open source projects and internally with uh, various trials. Um, and we look forward to bringing uh, new technologies into trials and also um, quick commercial adoption. Uh, Very good. Thank you and all. And you, you are. Oh, that's a really good point. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Phil Robb. I'm uh, the executive director of the Open Daylight Project as well as the vice president of operations for the networking and orchestration projects within the Linux Foundation. Uh, I spend most of my time right now pretty much splitting between Open Daylight and uh, ONAP. Um, Balaji, let's start with you uh, for questions. Just to give us a background, uh, what are the key technical attributes of uh, 5G infrastructure, bandwidth, device density, and so forth that we can look forward to in 5G? Yeah, thank you, Phil. Uh, Yes, before uh, I talk about uh, this particular, uh, you know, the key attributes of 5G, let's look at uh, what are all the operators' challenges as they think about 5G or migrating from 4G to 5G, how 5G will address those challenges, which is key attributes, actually. Uh, I'll sum up uh, the challenges into three categories, main categories. The very first one is, um, Operators are expected, users are expecting really complex services, especially in the area of uh, multiple vertical industries. So one service will pass through many vertical industry before being consumed by the end user. So operate, that's a big challenge, complex services. And the next is as part of the 5G, I mean, we have that in some sense in 4G because of virtualization, but 5G, it, people will expect, operators and the users will expect even much more advanced automation and agility. So what is agility in terms of in the context of 5G? So if you see agility, for example, uh, in general terms, when I receive a call from my enterprise customer or from my user, the way I take the requirements and the request and process it quick uh, and create a new service, right? Uh, that's basically time to market. That has to be really, really fast. Cannot take three months. Sometimes it may be expected in 15 minutes in 5G area. The next is fulfillment. Okay, we define the service, how fast you can fulfill and activate the service. So the agility is key, and that can be only delivered if your network is highly programmable and modular. That's very key, and 5G will bring all of that. And the last but not the least, you probably know most of us, cost. So they want complex services to be delivered fast and automated way, but at, at yet at a very cheap price, right? So cost is a key part. So 5G will look at all of these things uh, to, you know, some of, these are the key attributes. Now, going back, what is 5G, right? That's a critical to understand because we talked about 1G, 2G, and 4G. So 5G is not just purely, uh, just the radio technology. 5G will include uh, basically different access, the transport, as well as the cloud. In terms of uh, number of technology, which is 5G based on as of today, 5G actually will take even further new technology that is coming up. But as of now, it will include uh, network virtualization, network functions, and automation, management and orchestration, and many of these will come together. And actually, we'll also, for security, blockchain is coming up. So we'll use uh, for blockchain for data integrity. So all of this will play, all these attributes will play a major role in delivering services under 5G. 
Okay, very good. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment? Um, if I may to add, I think um, as Balaji has just summarized, um, you know, uh, for 5G, absolutely, you know, um, it puts a very peculiar requirements to the network. And some of the, um, you know, uh, for carriers, traditionally we, we provide uh, very few types of services. And our network is actually cultivated to that small set of services. But for 5G, um, you know, especially we have you know, very uh, different applications coming, coming in. And it has to be uh, deployed and managed and in an agile and reliable and also fault separated manner on the same infrastructure. That is the um, vision of 5G. And so um, as registration and automation is um, absolutely a key area, a requirement to that to enable agility, but also we believe that um, industry standards and common um, like consensus of how vendors would implement um, different like services of 5G. For example, there has been discussions um, about microservice um, architecture for 5G applications and how that would be implemented in a network function, granularity, or in the even lower a final grand uh, like microservice uh, level and how vendors could uh, work together to put um, put together that uh, into a feasible solution is still a big question. And one remaining, I think, is one of the challenges. Very good, very good. And I know certainly from my perspective, just as a user, um, as we've gone from 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, uh, now moving into 5G, we can certainly expect through the radio technologies, you know, significantly higher bandwidth uh, to support better video and so forth through our wireless networks, um, but also uh, with the expectation, expectation of IoT and the explosion of endpoint devices, it's really also about the, the density of those devices, um, just in general from a cell perspective, as well as uh, certainly from a, um, you know, intense densities from an urban setting. So starting with that, um, those are some of the requirements for 5G. And then, of course, there's the um, one millisecond um, latency uh, expectation. So we've got applications that are going to require much faster response times. Um, and as such, a lot more changes than just the radio frequency that support 5G. Um, Ling Li, so can you tell us a little bit about some of those new applications that are uh, to be enabled with this technology? through that improved infrastructure? Yes, from our view, uh, to start with, um, we actually have these enhanced mobile broadband applications, families including uh, virtual reality and uh, augmented reality, which would require, um, you know, um, also I think the ultra latency requirements as you, just, as you just mentioned. And the other type is I think, um, you know, the um, massive IoT applications, for example, vehicle to um, X, and also the smart factory um, applications, which also, I think, uh, also require actual reliability and also low latency. And um, some of the other applications, uh, like traditional uh, car network and transport uh, services, and also we wanted to um, enhance the um, network architecture and also um, uh, some of the more, I think, um, uh, features like um, agility to deploy more um, reach uh, applications via this common infrastructure and, and new technologies, things like that. If I take a, just add on to what Ling Li has just mentioned. Mm -hmm. One of the key uh, part as part of the 5G, again, virtualization is has already given us that opportunity, right? That ability to do things. Uh, so for example, we're talking about distributed data centers, centralized versus distributed. So some of the radio functions can be centralized, but in a distributed data centers, and some of the core functions, they, they actually live in a centralized data center. We can move some of them much closer, especially the one that is related with the user plane. For example, media codecs, right? Video and all these codecs can be moved much, much closer to the user so that the, the data plane stays as close to the user as possible. 
But going back to some of the use cases uh, is, for example, in 5G, uh, we can expect uh, uh, you know, fiber, fiber speed, actually. So it may actually work for fixed network as well. So some of the alternatives towards uh, instead of fiber, we could leverage 5G. And also uh, real-time uh, applications for the car. For example, just give a typical idea. If you use the same principle in 4G, for example, you use the car analogy, and if you want to apply brake for the car, it'll take, using 4G network, because of the latency, it could take somewhere around 4.5 feet to make a decision to apply the brake. But in 5G, because of this extreme stringent requirements on the latency, we could do that, that in a couple of inches. So that's what the expectation. So it will tremendously open up new opportunity for the new, uh, you know, different industry. Take an example on robotics. The very expensive machines you mentioned about the factory is exactly smart factory. So uh, in robots, for example, uh, you could take the control function, the brain, and take them and put them in a distributed data center closer to the production environment. Say if you have 50 robots, they're going to cost a lot of money. But the brain power is the key one that we take it and put it in the distributed data center. But you need to have a less latency. And the good thing is you don't need to have 50 brains. You could have 30 because it's virtualized. We'll leverage, you know, all of this, you know, the virtualization and the SDN will give those capabilities. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Heather, anything to add? Yeah. Um, I mean, when I was thinking about the applications, I mean, they, they, they've mentioned a lot of the ones that, you know, I hear on people's minds. What I usually like to think about are the ones we haven't invented yet, right? I mean, you know, the, the moment from when we went from you know, our old flip phones to our smartphones and all of a sudden the world was different. So, you know, when I think about things like NFV and SDN and their importance uh, for the network, um, it really is going away from these sort of spe special purpose boxes to this idea that you've got a flexible, upgradable, DevOps, agile infrastructure so that when all these crazy new ideas come out, uh, your network is prepared to be there for you. Right, right. And for me, that's, that's a lot of the tie-in, in the sense that, you know, this is, to support 5G, we're going to have to move compute and storage much closer to the edge, which means a lot more management and orchestration control from within the networks, where it used to be pretty much a centralized cloud. That leads back into network function virtualization and the activity being done by OPNFV. Um, so Heather, you know, as, as you look at that, how does OPNFV fit into 5G from your perspective? How are the service providers using OpenStack and OPNFV to build the software infrastructure needed to enable those new yeah. classes of applications? Yeah, and it's kind of what I was saying before, right? You know, we're, we're reimagining the network instead of being a set of boxes that do things to a, a flexible software infrastructure. And so, um, which is basically the promise of NFV. So to the extent that you want your next generation mobile network to have that flexibility, to have that agility, um, you know, NFV is really at, at the core of that. Um, you know, and what we've been doing with OpenStack is, you know, if you start building up that network, there are a lot of pieces that are necessary. Um, so OpenStack um, is very important to us. Um, also your SDN controller. There are various types of data plane acceleration technology that will certainly be important in a lot of these high throughput applications. Analytics that you might want to do on top of the network. And so within OPNFE, we you know, basically sort of work on the integration of all of those and make sure end-to-end -end use cases work across um, the different pieces that everyone is building necessary for the network. Yeah, if I may add, uh, yeah, absolutely. Sure. Uh, open source will play a major role across up and down the stack. Uh, so li like I said, 5G is not just uh, one area of technology. Just to give a typical example, we work with FIDO a lot, uh, which is data plane, right? So universal data plane, highly accelerated, because packets going in, packets coming out, that's the basic thing, right? but it needs to have a very low latency, and also we don't lose the packets, right? So for example, just give an idea here. We have a, in Open Daylight, we have a project called Network that will integrate with uh, FIDO using Anycomb. This is a very typical example, but small thing, but if you see the larger scheme of things in 5G, everything matters. All these things are integrated and connected. Yeah, yeah. and what, what I also think is gonna be really, really important going forward is, you know, we're here, we're at OpenStack, we're at in probably towards the you know, technology side of the world, but just you know, sort of cultural and process-wise, when you get to start thinking about a more flexible network or more software-based network, 
um, what that does open to you, but it does change when you're thinking about management and things that it's, you're not managing a bunch of boxes, you, you're managing compute and storage and network infrastructure, and so you know, a lot of the sort of thought processes that NFV sort of requires but enables, I think are still, you know, we're still kind of figuring out how to wrap our heads around thinking about the network um, in a different way. But I think that will definitely be key to really take advantage, I think, of, of what 5G might be able to enable. So I'd like to open it up for questions from the audience as well. We've, we've got mics here on either corner, uh, or in either uh, aisle here. <coughs> so feel free to stand up and, uh, and ask any questions that you might have. All right, but we'll continue on. Oh, no, we do have questions, excellent. Yes, sir. It's almost on. Tap on that. He says it's on. Try again. Nope, not. not on. What about now? There we go. <laughs> okay. We can hear you now. Awesome. Um, so this is a question for you, Heather. Um, you were talking about like um, performance in NFV. So obviously the 800-pound gorilla has been a. Uh, <laughs> Kubernetes. We heard that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm just kind of curious. Um, working specifically in the NFV space, we haven't seen really any big integration as far as the data plane side and high performance I/O inside of containers. And I'm curious if any of the four of you have been looking at that or doing any development in that space and what we might expect. Yeah, that's certainly a big topic on everyone's minds right now. Sort of how containerization and Kubernetes sort of fits into the stack that we've been kind of working with for about the past two and a half years. Um, you know, I think China Mobile actually sort of just launched a project in OpenFV specifically looking at container requirements. Um, we're basically, we're beginning to, to figure that out and I think that there's still a lot of open questions about the best way to do it and what sort of workloads will work best um, you know, with what mix of technologies, also depending on where they're placed. So. Um, I think the answers are, the questions are just now being asked and the answers are being figured out, um, is what I'm seeing at least. If I may add, thank yeah. you. It's a very good question on uh, containers. A couple of things, on the FIDO side, uh, we're looking at you know the containerized version of FIDO and also integration with Kubernetes. That's on the open source side. But from a vendor perspective, I could add, from a you know, large vendor in a 5G core, uh, many of, you know, we are right now, we started in 2014 actually, virtualizing, so the journey has already started before we talked about containers, right? So since 2014, uh, we started moving, our operators started asking as we started moving the function, actual network function to the virtualization, right? Virtual network functions, VNF. Traditionally, it was in VMs, but now uh, we are going towards microservices. What we call now is uh, cloud-optimized VNF. So it is a deal, right? You just cannot look at web scale. Yeah, I'm gonna just do that. Telecom is a little bit different because of the many real-time requirements. You can't shut the phone off just like that. It has to work 24 by seven. So there are very stringent requirements. So that's what we're talking about, cloud-optimized VNF. It'll be microservices based and containerized, but most important thing is uh, there are some design principles we'll apply that will be very telecom great. Yeah. And one of the complications too, right, is for most telecom network-centered applications, there's a great deal more state to manage. Um, so figuring out how that works in you know, some cloud-native you know, concepts is also something that you know, needs to get figured out. People, people are beginning to figure it out, and I have no doubt that our community will, but um, there's you know, there some, some you know, mismatches of sort of points of view kind of coming towards that. So it'll be, it'll be fun to <laughs> figure out. OpenNFV has been doing a great job for the system integration, verification, finding the issues, feeding back to the community, developing it awesome. And Ericsson is the pioneer for the radio and working with OpenNFV together. And now with Ericsson, Cisco, Red Hat for the FDIO with the Honeycomb integration, they have perfect job. The only thing that I see missing, which has been tackled by the core people, is the network slicing. So what is your view to implement network slicing, either part of OpenNFV or, or totally keep it out, or let the others to figure out how to handle it for repurposing the whole network by means of slicing, deslicing, and what's Ericsson's view to contribute in that way? Thank you. you I was gonna say, well, you, yeah. can, you can take it let first. Take I, I, I am sure that you have some views on network slicing, <laughs> so I'll let, <laughs> you, you. let you go. Thank you for that, yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, so uh, just to address the concept of network slicing, which is very critical, uh, the piece. So, okay, you have the network, and the slicing will include, uh, obviously, the radio piece is important, also the transport piece, as well as the core piece. I mean, <laughs> core space, right? But um, it's beyond not just the network itself. Network slicing also involves service slicing, very important. So there are, I see three layers of orchestration playing together to deliver the network slice. One is at the infrastructure, cloud infrastructure layer, which is each orchestrator. In this case, if you take OpenStack, or it could be a vCloud director, whatever. And then uh, that gives the flexibility on that layer. That's very critical. Then take up the next layer, which is a network management or a VNF application level orchestration. For example, NFEO, all of that. So you, you create more flexibility there. And the last piece is a service layer. So that's more of a business layer. So you know, different businesses, that's what you create the service. So we provide three layers of flexibility to create the network slicing, right? So network slicing, that means not just uh, you know, your uh, uh, you know, core network. It should be from the radio. Did I answer your question or? Yes and no. My, oh. my question mainly from open source or com community perspective, it's driven by the core people, M core especially, but nothing from open and MV right. to drive this to become a reality. So w what will be, we will be seeing as, as reality implemented by Ericsson driven by the open source community as open yeah. and MV? Yeah, so you know, pretty much for our, for our first two years, you know, we were we were fairly data center centric, you know, kind of, you know, in sort of what we were trying to pull together within OPNFV, we weren't really looking at at the multi-access edge quite as much. Um, we've actually just started some projects around that, both sort of with you know integration of kind of the more data center stack with core potentially at the edge. Also, Open Daylight has been doing a lot of work around. Um, sort of getting edge access and, and the, you know, the integration with the optical equipment and the line and speed, leaf and spine and all that kind of stuff. So we're, we're, just bring, we're basically bringing those in sort of right now and looking ahead to see some of that in um, our next Euphrates release. Um, so basically I think, uh, so to answer your question, there's been ongoing work within folks like Open Daylight that OPNFE is now, I think, ready to start integrating um, and addressing. Um, and then, you know, also you're going to that service and, and application layer stuff, you know, with the ONAP project that just got that just got launched with the merger of OpenO and Ecom. Um, you know, I think some of those business slicing you know, layer capabilities are getting implemented in there, and we're working really hard to work on that sort of you know infrastructure network and and back end integration piece um, in, between OPNFV and uh, ONAP right now. So yeah, I mean, Lingley might have some. Yeah, all these are enablers. Uh, I'm going to allow Ling Lingley to talk about ONAP. She's the expert here. But uh, uh, the, these are, they are the enablers, what you asked question, right? FIDO, the Open Daylight, OpenSec, they're the enablers to create the network slice. Yes, if I may add, I think LPLV is, uh, is actually um, acting as an integration project. And it, it takes from upstream and do the in integration testing. And uh, for orchestration, uh, for 5G, actually, ONAP has been targeted as address uh, that use case. But not, you know, for, uh, for release one, I, I, I believe. But we are actually doing the architecture design discussion, hopefully in a future-proof manner. So 5G will definitely be taking consideration. And, um, and I think that there is a also special requirements from 5G scenario is that you know, from the current architecture and discussion, we see that 5G actually requires two layers of service orchestration in addition to service orchestration. So that is exactly why we are we're actually proposing that ONAP to be take serious consideration of having yet another separated service orchestration uh, from the global like uh, view, uh, which is to take in consideration of the cross domain 5G orchestration from the access network transport network to the core network. Very good. All right, yes. so yeah, I'd like to continue to talk about this topic about slicing part, because I think 5G is most driven by 3GPP mostly, and we are talking about open source, how they work with 5G. I think the, uh, Balaji has mentioned slicing, like the three layers uh, for the service, I mean slicing and slicing subdomain management. So there are two layers. In the, <coughs> to the, in the service layer, 
But, but if you look at the e-com, I think there's just one layer of our service orchestration. But we look at the open world, it's more like two layers that is marching to uh, 5G architectures. So if these two architectures are not, I mean, converge, or they are not aligned with 3GPP, 5G uh, slicing architecture, then there's something we are not be, I mean, really aligned between the standard and open source. So what, what do you think about, uh, for example, from Ericsson point of view, do you think the uh, e-com is just one layer of service orchestration? How can they match into 5G, I mean, slicing architectures? And what about Lindley? What do you think about how the open if not being accepted, then how they own up can support 5G? Well, I can first start. <laughs> you take first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dengui. Uh, <laughs> 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 I'll hand that potato to you. <laughs> yeah, without taking into uh, different, uh, you know, angles here about uh, open sources, but I'm um, just from a purely technologist per perspective, right? To be honest with you, it's not one place. Uh, I mean, really, if you peel into the box, there's always a, you will see uh, a box, a function within that box that creates network slicing with uh, operationally, meaning operational characteristics, a function that will take care of, you know, you know, defining based on what the service layer is telling them in task or template. Uh, it is decomposed and given to the network slice orchestration level. It doesn't matter what, what we call the box in different areas by different companies, but at the end of the day, the function is the same, and that will actually deliver key characteristics that is required for that piece, right? So it gives that flexibility. Then the next layer is the business layer where you define the services that uh, you could have different service models, different charging models, different SLAs. So it doesn't matter those two boxes sit in one box. I don't see, for me it's a technology, uh, you know, so that's what I see it. Yes, I think, you know, uh, the requirements, I, I think first of all, we need to get aligned on the use cases and how we, you know, um, enable different use cases at what time frame. So for now, we might start with a simple use case, but um, I think you're right, we need to do the attractor design and have that discussion in a future proof, you know, like manner and looking at our 5G scenarios, more complicated ones into our design uh, from, from the first day. And um, as Balaji said, um, we, we're actually having those discussions right now, how to merge you know, from e-coms um, current architecture and with o open O. I think open O start with um, far more complicated use cases than e-com does. And right now we are having that discussion and um, I think uh, we are on a good way, right, Phil? Mm -hmm. and, um, and also we were taking absolutely consideration of 5G uh, scenarios because I think that is something that we need to do, right? Starting maybe some, sometime after next year, um, when um, the 5G standards are stable, I think um, next half of year, and, and that will be really close for us, and we need to take into account that uh, requirements and consideration right now. Yes. yes. So, so if I allow me to continue, I think the, uh, both of you answered very, very, very impressive. I mean, but I do see the gap, I mean, the, because the slicing of the two layers, but if you look at the ONAM today, it's there, I mean, if without include open world, it's there is one service orchestration layer. Mm -hmm. So if we still define the black box, say either include one layer or two layers, but I still see, because the, why they divide two layers, because the different vendors, right? So that's the requirement. If we just put into one black box, include everybody, I think that we are not going anywhere. So, that, so my, my recommendation is for the service orchestration layer, we do need two layers for the slicing. Otherwise, 5G will not be supported by all that. Thank you. Thanks, well, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, and that's actually a really good illustration. I mean, so obviously, a lot of folks in the room are open stackers. Um, and OpenStack plays a very key piece of what we're going to be doing to implement 5G through NFV and so forth. But Ding brings up a very good point with regard to how in, in the telco world, the, the meshing and the alignment between um, the standards organizations like 3GPP 
and the open source projects that are implementing against those or with those as they're happening in real time is something that I think this group of uh, end users has to deal with more than what we've seen in the past throughout the, open, uh, the OpenStack ecosystem. Um, and so it is, it's, it's a very important area. Um, ONAP, ECOMP, and OpenO are all relatively young. Uh, ONAP and ECOMP before they merged to uh, this new project called uh, ONAP. Um, and so those are questions that are, again, that development community is directly grappling with right now, uh, to which uh, OpenStack is a key component within that stack. Um, other questions? Yes? In, in that space, ONAP is not alone. There's OpenBaton as well. Absolutely. So if you look at ONAP as a merger of the e-com driven by at and OpenO by China Mobile, as my friend mentioned, merging these together w could be much more difficult than going another way like open button for for the rest of us, right? I mean, to see if these cars both compatible for network slicing for 5G or maybe another way. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll let others answer. I've, I've got an opinion there, but Please. so from my perspective, working with open source, the most powerful thing you can do is get an industry behind a common platform. This is why OpenStack has been so successful. Um, it got an industry behind enabling a platform that everyone could then build upon. I see ONAP, particularly with the merger between two different orchestration projects that had been launched separately, by combining those. Um, I'm confident, as I always am, when you put a bunch of developers uh, in a room, they come out with a really solid solution. Um, and that's what the developers are literally in the middle of right now between uh, merging um, OpenO and eComp. But when you get such a significant portion of the industry all rowing in the same direction with the foundation, it's just helpful to get past that point and get everybody building stuff on top of it more quickly. That's my perspective. Yeah. Um, from my perspective, um, within OPNFE, we tend to be fairly um, broad and big tent in our sort of approach to in that you know, we enable multiple different SDN controllers. Um, in our last release, um, we, we you know, did integration work around um, OpenO. We also had a pro project around OpenBaton integration. Um, but then it does illustrate a little bit of what, you know, what Phil was saying, is it's just the OpenBaton community was a little small, and they weren't able to kind of push the project, so that integration work through to, through to completion. So I mean, there's just a lot to be said about a critical mass of people congregating somewhere, um, because you can always solve software <laughs> problems eventually if you have enough of the right people working on them in a healthy culture with a good, you know, good support. Um, so, I mean, I kind of feel like you know, wherever sort of the coalescence happens, you know, to your point, developers in a room will, f will figure out figure out the problems, and we we need to have sort of that that critical mass together. And, and the other thing I always like to um, you know, pitch since there are people here, bring some test cases too, right? You know, I mean, there's a lot of good design work and stuff, but, you know, especially as a project that focuses so much on those end-to-end -end use case testing, um, you know, the more tests we have that sort of demonstrate requirements, then we can see where the gaps in the platform work, where it's falling down, um, where perhaps different solutions work better than others. Um, you know, that's, that's always a possibility. So, you know, bring more test cases, please. Thank you. So, Heather, I think the open fee is historically more like a manual uh, aligned, right? but look at the, the future 5G supporting, like yeah. ONAP supporting them, is different from manual, uh, if you look yeah. at the application controller. So, wh what do you think about how, how this being different architecture being converged in the future? I mean, the, to supporting 5G in the future, I mean, how ONAP and open fee, uh, they are not totally I mean, today's aligned architecture. Yeah. What do you think about this in the future? Yeah, so I mean, I basically think that there's there's development work <laughs> that needs to be done. Um, you know, one of the first things we're actually setting up with them um, is trying to get CICD, automated CI/CD pipeline integration coming from ONAP um, into the OPNFV um, CI/CD pipeline, which also brings in from FIDO and Open Daylight. Um, so that we can so we can just start actually laying down that full stack like on a nightly basis and doing some tests against it. Um, yeah. So that I, right now, from from my perspective, the the CI/CD pipeline integration is actually 
where for me, the, you know, the emphasis is on because then we have the tooling and we've started down that automation path of being able to, however ONAP goes, we've laid the foundation for, for, te for testing that. Actually, from my perspective, I didn't see, you know, um, you know those two approaches uh, diverse that much, and, you know, in terms of uh, OpenV and op OpenStack platform. Um, both, I think, uh, Mano or uh, at CNFP Mano um, architecture or uh, ONAP architecture actually uh, treats like uh, OpenStack as an external third party component. And what, what happens inside um, is actually irrelevant to OpenV integration test, at least from my understanding. Yeah, so, I mean, I think OpenV just uh, expand the scope to include the Mano, right? So that means they include the Mano. ONAP is like a more like app, application controller centric, but if, so if we all, I mean, if we all could be included, that be, should be aligned, but if not, then it's purely different uh, kind yeah. of uh, problem. I mean, starting, you know, uh, if you're looking at, you know, from the OpenStack point of view, uh, those APIs are actually partial or subset of, of the, you know, the Northbound API, so I don't see any difference. Okay. Very good. Okay. Any other questions? All right, well, then I'll continue on. Um, so Lingley, all of this change uh, to be able to support 5G sounds like a rather huge undertaking for the telecom service providers. What are the biggest challenges and major areas of focus in China Mobile for this transition to 5G? Um, yes, actually, uh, we have been working hard to enable this um, network infrastructure, especially enablement technology, SDN and NFV. We think that that is actually, um, you know, um, pre-requirements for, for 5G scenario. And second of all, as I mentioned earlier, we see that you know, we, we need industry standards to be ready. Um, and so we are also working hard in 3GPP and we we're actually also leading that discussion and looking forward to at least get you know, those specifications um, um, finalized, I think, uh, sometime around uh, next year. And also, um, because 5G has been, you know, um, specified as the microservice like uh, tagged application, and this is also the first one in 3GPP. So um, we, we're also um, working with band, um, par our partners to kind of like to figure out uh, what type of microservice architecture is needed for, for 5G use cases. Right now, we have two alternatives. Uh, one is very much like the NFV of virtual machine like banner. We have different network functions uh, deployed in different, uh, you know, like containers, but without any like further diversion uh, into a uh, microservice and uh, more, um, more final granularity uh, or basic functional pieces. But another alternative is that, you know, we're still drilling down um, another like level down and really divide it and decouple those sort of, like um, big uh, functions into small pieces. And that would require, I think, huge uh, transformation both from the infrastructure layer and also from the application vendors point of view, how, how they can align and be interpretable uh, between those different tiny pieces. Yeah, I mean, uh, in addition to what Lingli has mentioned, it's not just about the technology as well. For you know the you know we are talking to several operators. Uh, they tell us a lot of things uh, related with their business processes and uh, people's culture and religion within the operator community. Remember, these are 200,000, 300,000 people, almost a small country, and you know moving that whole force. Uh, you know you can have the best technologies in the world. But uh, people has to be retrained. Uh, you know the process needs to be changed. You know, imagine we deliver. It takes three months to do L3 VPN service, for example, right? And you are expecting uh, going to the new industry with the new business model. The expectation is to deliver the service in 15 minutes. And the worst thing is, uh, my CMO group will come and tell me, "Okay, uh, this product is great. Let's launch it to the market." And then, well, we are not getting a good uh, returns on this. Let's close it down, so we should be able to wind down as well. So that you know, so all the business process needs to be ready for that. The technology will be there, but that's many operators worry about that, and they're working on it to transform their force. Very yeah, good. Yeah, I, I think network ops culture is also going to yes. undergo a significant transformation. You know, the, the traditional mindset of you know net. 
network ops guy is I want to get something stable and then never touch it. Um, you know, don't, don't sneeze you know, near it because I don't want any downtime. But I, mean, I, I really think the sort of integration of um, dev, you know, DevOps you know, sort of style pipelines and managing your infrastructure on a much more regularly updating basis as well as the applications on top of that infrastructure is going to be absolutely uh, critical for folks to actually get the, the real returns on investment that they're looking for. I think from NFV in general and certainly in the, you know, in the 5G, 5G space as well. Yeah. That, that is something that I see as well. I mean, if, if you remember back in the day of the central database systems of the enterprise and how you couldn't touch those, they had to be scale up mainframe type hardware to when the enterprises moved to scale out Linux boxes. Um, you know, that type of change in thought process is now going on with um, the operators thinking that they, well, there's a big debate, you know, can you do DevOps in, in, in carrier type networks or is that just too unstable? And dang, I, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not going to let you ask a question because we're actually out of time. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, um, with that, uh, thank you very much, everybody. And please uh, help me in uh, thanking our panelists. <laughs>